Hey there everyone, welcome back to another Game Vault video. As always, I'm Captain Beefy with the Game Vault. We're going to talk about the developer for No Rest for the Wicked and his thoughts on why vi AAA video game developers are going to continue to struggle. Well, let's cue the music and we'll get right into it. Alright, so no rest for the Wicked developer predicts AAA video game developers will continue to struggle, and this is well, how he explains it. Uh, his name is Thomas Mailer, and in a post on X, Mailer stated, It is absolutely not a surprise to me that a lot of AAA studios have been struggling lately, and my prediction is that it won't really get better anytime soon. He then explained, I know it sounds absurd, but most of the game studios out there that hit it big were at one point just a small group of passionate folks that wanted to make games together, in a lot of cases they were just friends, and if they were lucky they found out in the process that they actually make a great team together. Then the games they created struck a chord and now they scale up and become a massive studio, Mailer elaborated. And then lots of other folks come in and demand this and that and unknowingly change the culture and the approach, and then we suddenly wonder what happened to this or that great studio. and that always delivered in the past once they're not delivering the same quality products anymore even though everything changed in their approach to making games. <clears throat> so, this is interesting because yeah, he's probably spot on on this from from the way things seem to operate in the, in the uh, game sphere, right? It seems like a lot of smaller studios put out amazing games, right? And you've got, you know, you got a small group of people in there working together they put out a game, they put out another game, something hits big, makes them millions and millions of dollars. They're like, hey, you know, let's let's do something bigger next time. So they go bigger and, you know, they hire more people on and so on and so forth. And eventually things get out of hand. And I, I think this happens with movies a lot too. If you look at movies and how, like let's take the MCU for example, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It started off with individual stories, Iron Man, um, Captain America, Thor. Then it went into the Avengers, which was a pretty big deal, you know. And then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger to where it was always a threat to the entire planet. And then it was suddenly a threat to the universe. And now it's threats to the multiverse. It just gets bigger, 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 and you don't back down. And as these things get bigger and bigger and more people get involved in it, things get watered down and less interesting and more... I don't know, it just feels like everything is just kind of like, blah, whatever, you know, it, it, it gets that way. And I know a lot of people leave these studios once they get bigger, you know, and I think we're facing a time now, in, in addition to what Mailer is saying here, I think we're facing a time now where a lot of the great talents in gaming are aging out of the industry. They're getting a little bit older, they're retiring, they're doing other projects, they're not, you know, they're not as interested in the uh, grind of these AAA game studios and all that. So they're passing the torch to younger people who are taking over. Now these younger people are being hired, unfortunately, not always on their merits. We see a lot of companies like Ubisoft and um, and uh, Activision actively promoting DEI hiring practices where they are hiring people not based on what they can do and their talents and how good they are, but based on the color of their skin, their gender, their sex, their sexuality, whatever, anything other than can they do the job? And it shows. It really shows because games lately have really been eroding in their quality and getting worse and worse and worse. And we're hitting a dark time in in gaming history where it looks like, you know, every other studio is closing down. Big games are losing hundreds of millions of dollars. Studios are closing left and right. People are getting fired. Yeah, it's bad. In the end, I think it'll be a good thing. I think it'll help purge the industry of all the excess, you know, people in there that don't belong there, the people that are in there for the wrong reasons, the the activists and the people that just want to send a message out there, and it's just going to leave behind the people that are truly passionate about gaming. And maybe we'll get some small, you know, smaller or scaled down studios that just want to make good games. Not everybody needs to make, hun you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. I think if, the, if these companies stay smaller, they're going to be successful more, they're going to put out better products. Yeah, everybody wants to make a buck. Everybody wants to sell out. You know, anytime there's a successful studio that puts out a game, 
all the big guys start, you know, coming around, knocking on the door. Hey, you know, we could buy you out and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Look at Xbox and, and you know, what Microsoft is doing. They're buying up studios left and right. And then what are they doing? They're closing them down. They're not putting out good games. They're not putting out any games hardly. You know, it's just, it's pathetic right now what's going on there. Sony, they're also, they're buying up studios left and right and all that. And sometimes they throttle these studios back and they don't, you know, I, I feel like, if they were left on their own, we would have more original and unique IPs out there rather than just kind of reskinned, rehashed games that, you know, we keep we keep seeing like a very similar style of game over and over again or whatever, you know, and all these games as a service and all that crap. I guarantee you a little studio full of passionate people would not put together a uh, a looter, you know, a, a live service game. Guaranteed. That's not in the that's not in the books. But let's move on. Uh, he made an analogy to the Beatles. He goes, I've compared companies to bands in the past because I think the analogy helps a lot of people understand that we're really dealing with the same issues here. Take the Beatles. They became successful, but now their record company tells John, Paul, Ringo, and George how they should write their songs. And, by the way, now they should also hire Lisa, Stewart, Shane, and Mary and have them be part of the songwriting team so they can produce more stuff. And, of course, these new folks should have the same say because otherwise we might just face diversity issues. Does anybody really think we would have gotten the same output had they been doing it this way? Of course not. And it's no different for game studios or any other group of talented people that produce art together, he declared. You have to keep that magic alive to make it work in the first place. We're dealing with humans here, and all too often the industry seems to forget that. I think Hello Games, to this point, is a really good example of uh, a smaller studio that, that does it right. You know, they've got No Man's Sky out there. They, um have been churning out content free of charge for that for years. Brand new content, additions to the game, just making it more and more just a meaty, fun game to get into. New concepts, new new things, these totally new things, new game mechanics, all this wild stuff. And they're doing it in a way that's costing you and me, the consumer, zero dollars and zero cents every time they put an update out. There's no microtransactions to support things. There's no DLC. There's no season passes. None of that stuff. And they're successful and they're making money. Now, they don't have 5,000 people working for them. You know, they don't have 10 different uh, studios across the globe. So they don't need to make that much money, but they're, I'm sure they're making damn good money because the game is a huge success and people are still buying the game. It's one of the most played games, but you know, it's probably one of the best uh, games of all time, I would say, in regards to overall how it's been handled out there. You know, the, a lot of games come and go that, you know, they're botched at launch really bad like this one was, and then they just fall by the wayside, they never get fixed, you know. Or there's some half-assed attempts to fix it, and it just never works, and it just kind of peters out and disappears. This game and Cyberpunk 2077 are two really rags-to-riches success stories as far as uh, games that were poorly, you know, released in a very bad state and then redeemed themselves down the road. Now, there have been other ones throughout history, but those two come to mind as, as two of the biggest, in my opinion. And, um, you know, so proud of these guys. And they've got another game, Light, Light No Fire, coming up. I think that's an Xbox exclusive, which is a little disappointing, but... Um, or maybe it's a timed exclusive, I don't know. But I want to support him for that game, so I don't know. We'll have to see what happens when that game comes out. You know, I may end up getting an Xbox just to play that game. That would sell an Xbox for me, but I know, I know Microsoft is courting those guys. I hope they don't buy them out. But I wish them all the success in the world, and I hope, you know, I feel like that's a small team that's going to stick together and continue to produce great stuff. You know, if they get bought out, it's over for them. It, 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 I guarantee you the next game out will be much more watered down and then so on and so on until the studio is closed. Anyway, the prediction and his explanation comes in the way of explaining why he agrees with Elon Musk that DEI kills art. Mailer posted on X, I never retweeted, retweeted anything from Elon before because I'm a game designer, but I very much agree with that statement. The problem with DEI isn't in its principle, but in the way it's being implemented. Years before DEI became a thing, we had Quentin Tarantino, a white director, make a movie about a badass black dude who buddied up with a white dude. My point being, just let artists be artists and DEI will happen naturally, he said. Ultimately, a good message has to come from the heart and not from indoctrination. And he's right. He's talking about Django and Chain there, but he's also talking about, if you go even further back, um, Pulp Fiction, right? That that was um, the, 
the movie that really launched Tarantino's career. I mean, yeah, he had um, Reservoir Dogs before that, which was kind of a cult hit and all that, but Pulp Fiction really put him on the map. And I, uh, what's funny is my, my grandfather loved that movie. And it was not the type of movie my grandfather would love. God rest his soul, but he loved that movie. <laughs> and that cracks me up because not his type of film, right? But here we had, this was long before DEI was a thing, and nothing felt forced in that movie. It was just absolutely insane and fun and badass. And everything he does pretty much is the same. Every now and then he has one that doesn't hit as hard as the rest, but for the most part, Tarantino's been spot on. Uh, Mailer also previously declared that Moon Studios does not force DEI into its games. He wrote, I'm still every now and then getting questions about whether we force DEI stuff into games we're making. So let me make it clear once and for all, absolutely not. I find that entire approach perverted. I'm an artist. I would rather quit than have someone else tell me how we should do our art, he explained. That would make a mockery out of everything I believe in. And he's right. And it's it's so frustrating to see this kind of stuff. The stuff you see on screen is only part of it. It's the stuff that goes on behind the scenes that really is what's making games suck, okay? Now, we may look at it, you may look at a game and say, oh, well, you know, they made the character a black woman. Yeah, okay, that's kind of annoying now because it happens so much that it's, it's expected now, and it's, and it's gotten to the point of ridiculousness. You know, they talk about representation in games and, and how they want more representation. So, your main gamer is a white male, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out there right now. That is the main person that plays video games. It's not 50-50 male and female, no. Your main guy, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's its a white male. And if you count Asians as white as uh, the left likes to conveniently do from time to time when it serves their purpose, then that is an overwhelming number of white males. If you count them as something else, then, you know, the white male and the Asian male are both your top two demographics, right? These are your top two. So, why are you making every game have a strong black female lead in it? That's probably one of your smallest demographics in gaming, you know? Not to discount them and to say, you know, they don't deserve representation or whatever. I mean, I, I find representation kind of foolish in the first place. Just make a game. You know, give a good story. Make it a great character. Make the character make sense, you know? If we're making a game about feudal Japan, give me a Japanese samurai, a man, a samurai, not, you know, an African, not a woman, but a male samurai, right? If you make a game that's set in Zulu, you know, in Africa, and it's about Zulu warriors, and I expect a black Zulu badass warrior to play that character. If it's in the Australian Outback, I expect an Aborigine. You know, if it's in if it's in uh, the United States before um, it was populated, you know, by uh, by Europeans and colonized, I expect American Indians in there. You know, whatever it is, I want it. I want that authenticity to it. I don't want things to be like forced. It's just absolutely silly that they do that so much. But it's what's behind the scenes. It's the DEI that goes on in the hiring process and putting people in positions of power that really weakens games and makes them bad. Um, Mailer continued, I've been very much outspoken on how I feel about consulting, and I still feel very strongly that if people haven't lived the process and don't have to think about the issues at hand 24-7, they will always deliver worse work than those who do. When it comes to the stories we're telling, I always approach it from a human angle first and foremost and let the story tell me where it needs to go. Now, I write. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a second. If it tickles me to have a gay character in our story, and I feel like the character could be fascinating, then I'll push for that. But I would never make a character gay simply because some outside party told me it's hip to do so, and that we might fake, face backlash if we don't he shared. Art fundamentally doesn't work that way. Now, when I write, I have an idea. I have a structure in my head of the story and the way it's going to go. You know, I create the characters, and then I set up little points in time in the story, like, okay... The character's here, this is the situation, and then I let the scene play out, you know. And I've had I've had situations happen where characters do things completely unexpected that I never planned on, and it impacts the rest of the story, but it works so well because these characters come to life as they go. When you force characters, it just doesn't work the same way. You know, when you're forcing and you could tell man, you could tell when people are forcing diversity into things. It, it's absolutely hilarious, you know, the stereotyping and the, the way they talk and all that. It's like adults writing for teenagers or, or little kids, you know. It never sounds right, right? Never sounds right. It's like Assassin's Creed putting out, um, or uh, um, Ubisoft putting out Assassin's Creed uh, Shadows and playing hip-hop music whenever the black samurai is fighting. It just, it's so cringe. 
everyone has stories inside them that are based on the experiences they went through in their lives and to, to me what elevates art beyond craft is when you've reflected enough to know who you are and then let those stories out because those experiences that you live through are most likely experiences that other people can relate to that will speak to them in a profound manner because they're real. Ori in the Blind Forest in many ways was about me reflecting on what it was like to see my father dying of cancer when I was 10 and being grateful to my mom, he shared. Wisps, on the other hand, was written when we all started to have kids in the studio and imagining what it would be like to have a kid with a disability. I wrote the first draft of No Rest for the Wicked quite some time ago, and that also came from a very specific place, he added. Mailer concluded, I hope that clarifies it for everybody. I've had to learn the hard way what it means to be an artist, and I'll never let anyone take that away from me. You know, and good, good for him, man. He's standing up. He's becoming a big voice in the industry now, and we're seeing more and more of this as individuals are standing up against this DEI nonsense and pushing back against it. It's not just, you know idiot YouTubers like myself that are out there making noise, you know, blah, 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 you know, people get pissed at me for it, you know, oh, I'm sick of hearing about it, well, don't watch the videos then, bro, you know, I won't talk about it when it goes away and there's nothing left to talk about, until then, I love gaming, gaming is a passion of mine, it has been for over, God, 40 years, coming on 50 years now, right, ever since I was a little kid, I want it to be the best it can be, I don't want it to get trashed by all these tourists that come through with their agendas and they just want to... They just want to mold it into something that it's not, you know? And they want to push back against the very people that made gaming great in the first place. The white guy, the straight white guy, man. You know, it's, there's nothing wrong with saying that's what built it, right? Chinese built the railroads in the U.S. God bless them, they did a great job. There's nothing racist about saying who built something or who helped make something great. And that's just, it's such utter nonsense. Now they just want to, they look at you with such contempt. You know, and the things they say and the hatred behind it and all that, it's utterly amazing. And that's why I won't buy games, you know, that are, that are, that push this DEI nonsense. I won't buy games that have voice actors or actresses in them that are outspoken assholes and that want to, you know, crap on the things that I believe in and all that. I don't buy it. I don't go to see movies that people do. I deny myself a lot of things that I normally would have turned a blind eye to back in the day, but hey man, it's war right now. I'm going to win this war with my wallet. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Ring that bell for notifications. I will see you all next time. Until then, peace.